Awesome. You know, how, how important was it for this movie to have the Thank action you. balanced out with the um, the emotional side, the the sun side? Was that important to have both of that? Completely. That's that's what I call a movie, right? That's a film. You know, like we all love action. The, the action is fantastic, it's not only, but on its own, I'm not going to see a movie with just crazy. I mean, I think my son probably would, who's 11, but for me, that's not going to... Hey, man. Hi. <laughs> so, this is a movie that is intended to play as it did when I first saw it to my mother-in-law, my wife, and my kids, and they all loved it. You know, my mother-in-law is not going to come and see a boxing robot film if it's just that. So, it's vital, I think. Also, because you've got robots... How do you feel for robot? Like, how do you actually get emotionally invested in it? And I think you do that through the people involved around it. How hard is it to find those kind of movies when the studios want to want these big spectacles and they want to put the money there? And I'm sure they're asking people like you to be in those movies. But mm. this one has heart and soul and a little spectacle. So is it is this a really movies rare like, find? Movies like this are very hard to find because it's one of the most difficult things to pull off. Um, a movie that genuinely plays for my mother-in-law and my six-year-old and 11-year-old kid, very difficult to pull off. I mean, Pixar seem to be doing it well, DreamWorks Animation seem to be doing a good job, but there's not a lot of movies that do do that. Um, and I think that's why it's difficult and rare. And for me, I just connected to the story. It reminded me of Rocky when I was growing up. Those sports sort of stories, they, it makes you feel good at the end. It, it's it's fun, it's entertaining, and... and a, you know, dare I say, it might even bring a tear to the eye. You but know, Char Charlie, well, I'm just going to say, but he's like an asshole at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. He's a terrible father. <laughs> terrible. And, uh, you terrible. know, so it's really a story about uh, redemption. redemption in a way, isn't it? It is a total redemption. Rocky is a standover guy who breaks your knees if you if you own money. I mean, he's not like the, the high school teacher, you know, who gets a shot at the title. He's a bit like he's lost belief in himself, Charlie. He doesn't... He thinks the world has passed him over. He doesn't feel anything anymore because it's easier to live that way. When when life is disappointing to you and you get hurt so much, you just end up switching off, you know. And I think that's something we can all relate to on some level, you know. So I think I fully expected us to be reshooting the movie after the studio saw it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, they agreed with the script, they loved it, but you never know until you see it fully together if you've gone too far. And I really applaud kind of. DreamWorks and, you know, Disney, who are distributing the movie as well, that they went for it. Well, Sean said he applauded you because <laughs> you were worried because Charlie's such a horrible father and so tough with this 11-year-old kid, mm. he doesn't even know how old he is, uh, that, you know, this is not the kind of thing, this is the... This is the kind of thing that could alienate an audience. And right. he said if it wasn't Hugh Jackman doing this, there'd be a big issue yeah, there. I mean, I, I never worry about that. I mean, I, I kind of have no sense of what people think of it or what, how that translates into a character. But regardless of me playing it, I think it's important to see there's something to be redeemed from. If it's a redemption tale, you have to see he's made mistakes and he's, you know, you have to, it has to be real in a certain degree. Plus... You know, there's a couple of things here. That, that relationship with Evangeline Lilly. You have to feel the history. And is this going to feel trite or stereotypical? With the boy, you know, how is that going to play out over a movie? How are we going to see them turn around without it feeling too saccharine or sweet or, or fake? You know, these are the... That's the biggest challenge of the movie. Was it ever uncomfortable for you yelling at Dakota and like, being as mean as it? Did you ever feel like you had to pull it back a little bit to have this character really Yeah, and Sean it? kept pushing me to go further. <laughs> and Dakota's a very polite, well-brought-up kid as well. So Dakota was kind of getting prodded as well, and several times I saw Dakota after cut look over to his mum like, no, they told me to say that. <laughs> but, truth be told, I kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> First of all, concerned? I really like him a lot. I, I genuinely love Dakota. He's a great kid great actor. I love being with him. And I have kids. I have an 11 year old. I'm, literally, there's times you want to say things, you're like, mm, and you just shove it back down inside. I've walked out of rooms. I mean, so frustrated for fear of what I'm going to say in that mode, you know. And for three months, I was like, uh, it all just came out. <laughs> Has he seen it? Has your son seen this? And said Absolutely. He loved it. He, did, he doesn't talk about the father and son. He did say to me, so can I drink sodas for breakfast now? <laughs> but genuinely, he did not talk about it. That He just got wrapped up into the 
um, story of Adam. He loved that robot and that idea of that robot. Like he saw the magic in that robot, just like you know, Dakota's character does. And Charlie also has this redemption as a fighter at, for the end in right. that fifth. And that, that to me, I thought was a stroke of genius. Like it's so inventive the way you see him coming to life again. And that moment, I'll never forget, as we we're filming and they're filming at Dakota and the camera's coming around the ring and and he's watching like getting into Adam, you know, coming back, fighting back, and then he catches his father out of the corner of his eye, and you just see it all go to Charlie, and then all of a sudden, there's, oh, I mean, there was not a dry eye on that <laughs> monitor, true. let me tell you, it's that, and to me, is singly one of the most powerful moments of this film, because it's saying so many things about how we need our father, how we need our fathers to be at their best, too, we need to see them fully alive, and and in this moment, you see him doing the thing he loves to do that no one else has allowed him to do. The world has said, we don't care about boxing, you're gone. So it's sort of, and that's another bit, of, like Anthony Mackie's character and, and Kevin Durant's character and my character, all boxers, and now they're just desperately trying to eke out a living and they've been discarded, you know. So, can you talk, okay. I was just going to ask you, can you talk a little bit about working with Sugar Ray and was he like brutally honest with you? And, oh, yeah. and what, is, what was the... <laughs> I mean, you know, he comes from a boxing wall. No one, no one pulls punches to them, you know, the whole way. You know, they, they're told exactly the way it is. Um, and that's the way he is, too. He was very sweet natured. Have you? Or, oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And ridiculously handsome. You can't believe that guy was ever <laughs> yeah. handsome. Yeah. Like he's, and he hasn't uh, really, he hasn't really he aged. He hasn't aged. Yeah. 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 I'm like, what is wrong with you, man? What, uh, it's unbelievable. <laughs> and got it together and sweet, nice and happy. And I'm like, you fought with. Duran, like you know, this is anyway. So, what was so his he was on. We talked a lot of. He, you know, I'd been doing some training when I saw him, and he was like, hey, "You got a little more work to do, pal." <laughs> so he was honest with me about that, and then he talked work me out. a lot. You're in great shape. No, but I needed to look like a professional boxer. Thanks, come like a professional boxer. It, it, it was vital, not from just I want a boxer to say, "Oh, yeah, it looks like he knows what he's doing." As I said, that's when he comes alive, that moment. You need to see him, you have to believe that moment. In but his face. As he boxes. It's like his whole being comes alive again, you know, fully. And he also talked to me a lot about the corner man, um, about how he kept doing this to me. And, I guess, man, and he'd be behind the monitor and I'd be right by the ring, you know, we're doing cameras on me and we're doing scenes. And he's like, man, no, no, he's like, oh, he's like, he kept your strength through your eyes, the emotion through your eyes to that robot, to the human boxer, is everything. I said that's going to allow the audience to believe in the robots. It's going to, it's going to sell. Your your strength is is how strong your um, robot is. Mm -hmm. Does your fight training from previous films come into play when you're working on this, or is it a whole new skill set that you have to? Learn? This is different because it's traditional boxing. You know, uh, the other film like Wolverine, you don't have to, you know. And always have to have your fists up, guarding your face and your chin to your chest. Well, it's just got claws and it takes your head off, you know. It's, uh, yeah, I had to be a little more specific about it. And isn't this a difference for you for years uh, since, I mean, you've been doing like action movies, it seems mm -hmm. lately. This is, is something well, I haven't so really this done goes any back to the two years, so it's been nice. But, <laughs> but I, isn't, I mean, yeah, this is the nice. prestige. It's nice to be something. in a, um, an action movie, I suppose, where I'm not doing any of the action. It's kind of <laughs> nice. Why is. Like time after time, generation after generation, do boxing movies <laughs> just work? Like, what do you think it is? They don't all work, but I know what you mean. It's I I think dramatically, it's such a perfect scenario. You have simple cast, two cast. You have a very confined space. You have clear de delineation of victor and vanquished. You have probably the greatest test there is for a human in terms of mixture of of courage, of mental, of heart, of mental acuity and relaxation and strength and brawn. It's like, that's why it's always been around, some form of it. I mean, football is just sanctioned boxing, really. I mean, it's all those things that that we see naked. you got these guys that just wear shorts, they're not even wearing clothes. It's like all stripped down. So you see everything that's going on and somehow the pressure of a fight we can all relate to is probably all of us can feel your heart beating imagining what it'd be like stepping into the ring what are the ones that and for me yeah probably the first one i really connected to was tyson 
I was never allowed to watch boxing growing up. My father was a champion boxer, and I never knew about it until his brother told me when I was about 16. Wow. wow. Um, because my brother and I used to beat the hell out of each other, and so my dad probably rightly assumed, I'm never going to talk about boxing, I'm never going to show them boxing, I'm never going to show wrestling. So, I mean, of course, my mates at school, we would do it, but my never, dad, dad never talked about it. So, I never really discovered, I was not watching fights when Sugar Ray was boxing, I was not Ali, I knew about him, but I discovered them later. It was Tyson that first kind of really got my attention. But movies, boxing movies. My favourite boxing movie is When We Were Kings, which is a documentary. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the greatest movies of all time. Very inspiring. Uh, Rocky, Raging Bull. Uh, I liked Hurricane. I like. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of great movies. Well, Sean mentioned the um, the champ as being an influence on this film. Obviously, you know the the, the child, the son story. There mm. was that something. That, did you go back and look at that? Was that? I didn't go back and look at it. I had seen it before. I. Mainly I didn't go back because I, I didn't have the strength to cry my eyes out. I remember crying that it was like, it's so brutal, that film, you know, it kind of rips your heart out. But you can't make a boxing movie without being fully aware of the just the mountain of history there is in that genre, you know? Mountain. Uh, and some people have said to me, you know, there's things that are reminiscent of Rocky, and I'm like, yeah, you bet there is. <laughs> and why not? You know, I feel like this is Rocky for a new generation, and I... I said, plus, the other thing is, man, you've got two choices. There's really only two outcomes at the end of any boxing. It's not like there's a hundred million ways. I love The Fighter, by the way. I love that movie. The Mark Wahlberg. Loved uh, it. Christian loved it. It was great. You know, it's, it, there's something, and as Sugar Ray says, no champ ever came from Beverly Hills. <laughs> <laughs> so we instinctively know that boxing stories are going to be people who've had, done it tough. And we all... At some point in our life, no matter where we come from, feel like we've done it tough and we relate to that feeling of rising above the circumstances that we've been born into. You know? What are the things that you have done with your kids to, to have that special bond, that thing that the two of you share, like the characters end up sharing in this movie? I, uh, well, interestingly, my first son, I was really looking for, I'm a huge sports fan, I think it's going to be awesome. Though. My wife sort of into a note, I thought I'm going to go to it. My son hates sports. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh man, I said, okay, well, at least we'll kick a soccer ball. Hate it. Throw a baseball. Hate it. It's like, I was like, this is unbelievable. And then it tweaked to me that actually what the gift of having children is, is they come in with these things, maybe different to what you're into, but because you love them so much, you want to be with them so much and connect with them. I found myself in more museums looking through geological books. My son knows the name of every tree that you would ever see, the botanical name as well as its real name. We dig through the dirt, insects. The, like, I can tell you things about history of cultures and tribal history that I never thought I would have known. So really it's about listening to your kid and, and connecting with them, you know, rather than forcing them to like the things you like. And, uh, you know, it seems uh, wonderful you're coming back to Broadway finally. You're doing this concert yes. thing uh, yes. with an orchestra, just yes. you. Yep. And then you're, that's sort of like a preparation to go off to do this musical of Absolutely. Les Miserables. Yeah. That sounds crazy, Hugh. I Why? mean, well, because musicals are just such a hard thing, and they this Les Miserables has been around for 25 hey, or 30 I years. I just did a movie about robot boxing that's supposed to, <laughs> that's supposed to uh, make my mother-in-law happy, okay? All right. I don't mind a tough ask. <laughs> but movie musicals, if you're going to do one, it's, it does help to one of the most beloved musicals of all time that's probably the second most successful musical of all time, playing Jean Valjean. It's like, it's a great part. And, you know, Tom Hooper's directing it. From King's Speech, King's his first Speech, film. Uh, Russell Crowe, Mange Javert. I, 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 it feels special to me. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're going to give it a good old college try anyway. Is it going to be theatrical rather than realistic? Or do you know? No, it? Tom, if you look at Tom's work, I think he's realism based. You know, like, there'll be a lot of research. It will feel real. I mean, look, we're singing. Okay, so <laughs> you, are, you are asking a leap, but I don't know if you've seen the musical. Five but, times. Well, Trevor Nunn, who directed that, is a massive... Did you see how many props there were in that thing? Real cutlery. I mean, it's a musical on stage. It's like 600 people in the Master of the House, you know, Master of the House. They've all got vintage forks and spoons <laughs> and plates. And the, the prop master's like, you're kidding me? Like, so once you... And the, 
this is it's down to the performer and really to Tom to get the audience to buy into this convention that we are singing what we're feeling. Oh, and you're right. so we know you had but this is such an emotional piece. I feel it plays in better than most. We know you had the musical chops. How's Russell singing? He's got him too, man. I, he was in musical yeah. early on in he's Australia. Band. He's he's in band. Band. Yeah. Prior to having a band, he was oh, in the Blues right. Brothers in Australia. Mm. You've got to understand, the thing about Australia is there's probably 10 movies made a year, so <laughs> no one thinks I'm going to be a movie star. You're like, wow, you, you're going to be living in a trailer park. You know, <laughs> you could be the most successful movie star there is. And, you know, no one's making a living, so you've got to do everything. You know? Wolverine 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 Wolverine. Wolverine. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But is is yeah. this what we can say? Is Wolverine so coming long. back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were that really will be made then. The Absolutely. We, we if it wasn't for Lame is we we're ready now. Now that Jim's on board, we're kind of ready to go, but uh, we would have had to have started for Wolverine uh, for Lame Miz to work, we had to start basically yesterday. So we couldn't quite make that when we needed to press the button. We weren't quite ready, and so it'll happen straight after. Okay. Mark got... Bomback was doing some rewrites yes. on Wolverine. What, what was he addressing with that script? Well, when a director takes over any script, um, they see it. They need to make it their movie, and so Jim hired Mark to help him uh, make the movie his own. You know, Darren had worked on the script himself and had taken it in a certain direction that was right for Darren. And, you know, that would have been a great version of the movie. I've seen Jim's version of it now, and, you know, Jim saw things that weren't working for him that were working for Darren. You know, and that's... Mm. I, I got to hand it to Fox and hand it to Jim. Uh, we... It's easy when you start with by far the best script we've had, right? Chris McQuarrie, which is why Darren signed story. on. Mm -hmm. So once you have that... That's 80%, 85% of your movie. Then the, the director needs to make it their own. This know? is Darren Aronofsky? Yeah. It was going to be Darren. And Darren's personal life uh, precluded him from making the movie. So, uh, you know, I asked him to do X-Men 3. I asked him to do Wolverine 1. And he was <laughs> like, eh, it's not so much for me. And then he read this. He was like, oh, man, I mean, this is the best This is the best comic book movie script I've ever read. You know, he's been dying to do one for a long time. So, so is it going to be like a really... Uh, horror movie in a way? No, it is a little darker than what we've seen. I think a little more true to the character. Is it really Why do you from the Chris Claremont Frank Miller yes. series of the 80s? Of the uh, Japanese saga? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What? But if you read all of that, there's a lot of it yeah. and it yeah. is a little disparate and some yeah. of it's got X-Men in it. There's a wedding and if you know yeah. all that and some of it doesn't and so we take license with it. Why do you so think the X-Men movies and the Wolverine uh, movie, why do you think that they have... Um, done so well because most comic book movies let's be serious have not been really? very successful really yeah wow <laughs> pretty, pretty clear commercially oh uh, commercially and critically i mean well, some have done all right but i mean look at green hornet that was yeah, horrible can, but spider-man yeah Marvel but spider-man iron yeah, man I mean, it's just dark knight well this year has not been the best movie or best I first comic book movies be i think best. what yeah. happens generally is you find like when x-men came out it was, trust me, cold as ice. There was not one comic book movie out there. I had several people saying, make sure you've booked your new, next movie before this thing comes out. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, like, book it, because you're going to be right back to the end of the line, pal, after this. Mm -hmm. And Brian Singer kind of reinvented it, because they'd become cartoonish, the latest Batmans and the old version, mm -hmm. become very cartoonish, and people were like, well, oh, I don't care about this. Brian reinvented it and made you care about the characters beyond the special effects, and and made you kind of, I don't know, relate to these characters. Then came a little movie called Spider-Man, and mm -hmm. then blah, 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 and they kind of... I think there was that, this can't really last. So six, seven years later, Nolan comes out with Batman, and, and lo and behold, these movies are not only commercially very successful, some of the best reviewed movies of all time, and mm -hmm. I was saying, all right. So then you get what always happens... When finally Hollywood goes, oh my God, this is a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. Every movie's going to win. <laughs> yeah. Let's dig up anything with God. And maybe some of the source material was ill-advised, great for a comic book and ill-advised for a movie. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens with musicals. Like Baz Luhrmann came out with Moulin Rouge and then a whole lot of people made musicals and some worked, Chicago worked, but many didn't. You know, mm -hmm. and it's, it just, it's got to have a reason to be a movie. Why is How did you coming around to an X-Men 4? 
eventually. I was just asked why James Mangold is the right director for this for this. Project. Many directors wanted to do this film. I'm happy to say, because of the strength of the script. I know James. I know Jim. When he came in, he just had such a clear vision of where this movie should go. He had the best take. Uh, he's done many, many genres, and uh, I know he's done many things. But I look at Three Tender Humor. Mm -hmm. I'm like. And when he started talking about the outlaw Josie Wales, I was like, mm, okay, now I think we're on the right track. And then he had a couple of things which, even with Darren's version of the script, I think hadn't been solved, that he just knew he had the key. You know, like, he had the key to the script. It's very hard to explain. See, with this movie, Spielberg said about Sean, I don't know if you read the quote, um, he said, Sean's made many, many successful movies. I don't know if you know, it's like one of the top ten grossing directors of all time. But he says he's made many, many successful movies, but this is his first film. And there were not, when Sean Remy says, none of my movies I've done are going to make you think that I can make this film. Um, and then he proceeded to go into his vision. And all I can tell you was he was, in directorial terms, uh, like Kobe Bryant. He just had that <laughs> thing, like, give me the ball. Well, one thing two seconds to go with two points behind, give me the ball. And I just felt it Im immediately. One so, and Jim has that too. I, I, I wondered how... You know, one of the miracles in the movie, maybe, is that you weren't upstaged by these huge robots. No, Why I think, you... in all seriousness, there's great restraint uh, from Sean. He never lost sight of the fact that we need to make people feel for these robots. This is not a showcase. This is not a special effects extravaganza. This is not, whoa, cool. The only goal is, at the end, to have people cheering and feeling for that robot. Now that's not an easy thing to achieve. And there's great restraint. All the special effects, are, which are brilliantly done, and I can tell you, not easy and the latest generation, there was only one goal, which was to draw the audience and believe in this world. There, the great cameo you had in X-Men First Class. Right. Um, why, why, I mean, tell us how that came about, and then also why you still hold that Wolverine character close to your heart, like why you still want to play him a few more times. They asked me to do that cameo uh, a year before I did it, and I said, all right, pitch me the concept, and I thought, okay, I like that. I said, <laughs> I said is anyone else swearing in the movie? They said, we don't think so. I said, promise me no one else swears in the movie I'm in. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's the only F word in the history of the X-Men franchise. You got it. Yeah. So, uh, and I was like, perfect. This is great. This Wolverine, 50% of Wolverine's dialogue should be fucked. <laughs> <laughs> that feels right for me. Jeez, Jeez. And actually that particular take was a little ad-lib idea at the end. So uh, it was like the last take we did. But we were going to do, they asked me to shoot it down in Savannah when they were there. And then they said no. Then they said we're going to shoot it in LA. And they said oh we don't need it. And then they came around to reshoots and they said look we, uh, we actually think we have more film than we, we can cope with. We probably don't need the cameo. And I said, fine. And they rang me a week later and said, oh, look, it's such a good idea. Let, let's just shoot it. We probably won't use it in the movie. But can we just shoot it? And I said, fine. I mean, there was, there was not more secrecy to that than I've ever known. I, I actually checked into the hotel and they, they said... Under uh, an assumed name? I didn't realise. I said, uh, you know, Jackman. And I said, there's no reservation for you. And I was like, I'm pretty sure there is. And finally, I was under some comic book name. I can't even remember what it was. <laughs> like, even a hotel would, had to be booked under some weird name. James wow. Probably, it wasn't even that, it wasn't that <laughs> obvious. It was really random. So, last and just, do, do you I didn't you, ask you the last question. Oh, just why you still hold that character so close? Why you still want to be him? If you I, lo I, I love that character. I feel like... Mm -hmm. It was the first film I did in America, and somehow I lucked upon the greatest of all the superhero roles. Because mm -hmm. back to your point, he feels very his human dilemmas and demons and battles feel well. They feel human. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't feel like a. Uh oh, I'm sorry. It's not much longer, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> that I don't feel. I don't feel. Uh, like a guy with claws and ridiculous hair. I feel like a guy battling against life, you know? And I wonder... Do you see uh, coming around to an X-Men 4 at some point, or do you think at this point it's just going to be Wolverine on his own? I don't see that, yeah. I, I can only see one movie ahead, and I know... I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm well into the second half of this match. I, I don't know exactly when the, the end is, but I only go one at a time. And, um, if this is the last one, I, fingers crossed, man, we're just going to finally get that hole in one, you know? Could you see yourself popping up in a first class part two? Hmm. If they come up with as good an idea as last time, I'm going to see it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 